Yeah, yeah. 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 Right, good morning. Um, welcome to track three. So I'm Shelley Atkinson, I'm looking after track three today. And um, actually, delighted that we've got Ollie Steens um, with us here. Ollie started his career as an EDA software engineer. How do you know that? <laughs> Ooh, bio. <laughs> I don't remember submitting that. Oh. <laughs> well, really, isn't yeah. It? Isn't it? yeah. Where did they, did they get the info from? It's that point where I realised I do need my glasses. And so, writing RTL and gate level simulators, you joined ARM in 1999. Yep. Focus on engineering productivity. The company is responsible for the overall architecture of the engineering platform, as well as leading exploration into future innovations and evolutions, such as cloud based engineering. Big data workflows and infrastructure as a home. This sounds so grand, doesn't it? Yeah. So, over to you. Thank you. Yeah. So, hello. Yeah, right. I don't need to introduce myself. That was perfect. That's who I am. Um, and my aim here today is to talk quickly and get you back on track because we don't want to be uh, missing out on the coffee breaks. I can tell if I linger on any one particular slide, it's going to go dark. So that also is motivation for me to, uh, to keep going. Right. So hello. Um, I threw a quick slide in at the last minute because I suddenly, I, I'm, I'm very used to people knowing who ARM is. Um, you know, because we, we, we're quite successful and we're somewhat of a, of a known brand in the, uh, in the world these days. But in case you don't, we are the world's leading semiconductor IP company. Um, so anybody that has one of these or similar has got a lot of ARM technology. In fact, I'd guarantee that you all have an awful lot of ARM technology in and around your person and your home these days. Um, we're about a 5,000 strong company headquartered in Cambridge in the UK. Um, up until almost a year ago today, we were uh, one of those British success stories. A year ago today, we were bought by a Japanese company called SoftBank, who none of us had ever heard of before. But hey, that's cool, actually. We now have one shareholder instead of lots. Uh, and he's a shareholder with a really long-term vision on, on you know, getting some uh, fundamental changes into, into the tech landscape. So it's turned out to be uh, quite liberating in some ways, uh, and quite nothing has changed in others. Um, we celebrated, I've, I've been at ARM for 18 years now, and, and you know, I remember we celebrated when the sort of billion, when we worked out that the sort of billionth chip had, uh, had shipped that was on an ARM-based uh, technology. Uh, we then celebrated when we realized that we reached about a million a day, and, and so on and so on, and, and I think people have lost count now. Um, so it's somewhere around 100 billion ARM-based uh, chips. They, they're, the IBM guy was talking about, what was he talking about, hundreds of billions of IoT devices. Our, our Japanese boss these days um, talks about a trillion, a trillion IoT devices, all powered by ARM. At some point, I think 2025 or something is, is that sort of thing. Um, ARM is very successful um, in, in establishing an ecosystem with loads of partners. So we're one of those IP companies that don't make anything. All we do is design stuff, um, and then we have a partnership up the chain that turns it into uh, product. So there you go. That's who ARM is. Um, right. Just to clear up why I'm here and why I'm speaking at Tech Exeter. So um, you know, I didn't want you to think that this was some sort of evil marketing dissemination thing, let's get ARM people spread around the UK in every single tech event, making sure that, that our presence is known. It's nothing like that at all. Um, the, over here on the, on the left, you can't see it. This is a list of all the ARM offices. Um, I use this list from an internal magazine of ours, because if you go to ARM's website and click on the show me the offices, it really only shows you a few compared to where we actually have people doing engineering work. So I took that list and I plotted the UK ones on this map. There weren't any in Scotland, so I was able to chop that off and highlight it. Um, so these are where all we have engineers in ARM in the UK working. And uh, as you can see, there's no real grand plan here. It's not like a careful strategy of, uh, of making sure we think. 
as you can imagine, a lot of this is just accidents of acquisition. You know, we acquire a small company because um, they've got some really cool tech. They happen to be in Warwick. We're like, Warwick, really? Okay, we'll stick it on the map. We'll move on. Um, but you'll see, that, you know, there's nothing down here uh, where we are. Um, and then, yeah, you know, so this is actually where I work here, Cambridge headquarters. But this is where I live. Um, and that's why I'm here today. I'm here as me being a technologist that lives in the, in the Exeter area. Uh, I moved to the Exeter area about six months ago. Um, and part of that decision-making process was, um, you know, is it a good place for a technologist to be? And, and did a bit of research, decided it was. And so I've done that move. So that's, that's me. Um, reality is, of course, where I really work, because of what I've done, is here. And I say, yeah, there's an office in Cambridge. There's my home in Topsham, actually. Um, and then there's coffee shops in Exeter that I am discovering and liking. You know, happy to take any suggestions of other ones. Um, uh, there's a train. I spend a lot of time on the train between Cambridge and Exeter, and I do work on the train. That I quite work. And then I get to Cambridge, and there's sometimes, even though I've got all, gone all the way to Cambridge, I'm like, can't be bothered going to the office. So there's coffee shops in Cambridge that I know and love um, that I will sit and I will work in. Um, and I didn't show you my favourite coffee shops near London Paddington, my favourite coffee shops near King's Cross, which I use as part of my journey across there. But you get the, you get the idea. I'm fairly mobile. I can work from, from pretty much wherever. Um, and that's great. And that's one of the reasons that's allowed me to move down here to join you guys in, uh, in the... Slightly damper than Cambridge, it has to be said, southwest. Uh, I'm not sure what my bio said I do, but basically I'm, I'm, a, I'm an architect of, of sorts. So we have an engineering platform. This, I do apologize, the quality of projection here is awful. So there's a lot of fine pictures where you can't read the words. This is a sort of representation of our internal engineering platform. So you know, that we build and we maintain and we run an estate that our engineers use to, to do all their work. Uh, and this is sort of one of the views. This is one of the views. I, I, I kind of am the overlord of this from an architectural point of view. Um, my group does a lot of proper enterprise architecture type things. So, you know, future states and maps and catalogs, capabilities and things. We do a lot of pathfinding, which is where we're looking at new technology and we're looking at what's changing in the world and we're saying, could we use that? Is that relevant to us? Yeah, could we make use of that? Um, and then we do an awful lot of um, forensic work as well, you know, really digging into what's going on on this platform and saying, is it optimal? Are we, uh, you know, are we delivering the value to the, to the customer and those sorts of things? So it's an interesting job. Um, I always like to get this picture into any talk I give. This is Damien Newman's um, seminal work this is the squiggle of design. Um, so this is his, um, his idea of, this is what happens in the design process. Um, and this is the actual squiggle, by the way. This isn't just any random squiggle. This is his actual squiggle. You can go and you can download it as a vector image and put it up there. So it's not just, I didn't just sort of squiggle on a page. This is the one. Um, but, but the idea is that, you know, there is a few of us that work over here in this mad space of uncertainty. Um, and what we do is we, uh, we help to clarify that so that, um, so that the execution over here of, the, uh, of what's actually going on is smooth and, and less bumpy than it, than it can be. And, and it's a sort of a two-tier effect for, for me. So you know, we, we maintain a, the engineering infrastructure. So that needs to be stable, that needs to be solid, that needs to be performant, that needs to be feature-rich. Um, People don't like that to change very often, though. So the people that are developing that, for me, need to be in this space here in terms of having a clear idea of what features they're adding to that and what's purpose is and who the end users are um, so that we're not introducing this sort of churn into, um, into what our engineers need to be a stable environment. At the same time, we have engineers working in this sort of mode on top of our platform that we have to support and, and others working in this sort of mode. So it's a, it's a great picture. And then the other great thing about having the word architect in your title is that you can put 
random slides up from brilliant architects of, around the world. Um, and typically, most nine times out of ten, a proper architect, someone that designs buildings, will have a quotable quote that is very relevant to computer architecture as well. Right. So, this is a quick summary of 18 years of lessons learnt on running infrastructure. And I'm going to go through in a bit more detail and I'll come back to some of these. Um, you'll notice very an inconsistency between what I write here and what I then write in later on pages, but hopefully you can see the, the meaning is, is correlated. Um, I'm not going to read these out loud, you can read them to yourself. But you know, one size does not fit all. When, you, when you're dealing with varied types of engineering, and I'll come on to that in a minute, you, know, you, you really do need to support different, different systems in, in different ways. Um, not everyone is double deep. Anybody heard the term double deep before? Okay, there's a body called the Leading Edge Forum who are um, technologists in, that help the companies like ours understand the world. This is one of their really horrible phrases. Um, but what, what they're saying is, you know, you might be trained as a physicist, but in reality, in today's environment, not only are you an expert in some physics domain, you're probably an IT expert of some sort or other, because you have to be to do your job, and therefore you're double deep. You have two areas of expertise. Um, and not everybody is double deep. So you, um, so double deep is an interesting one, right? So firstly, we get a lot of engineers who think we're idiots because we can't run, we can't keep the wheels on the bus, and surely it's a simple thing because they know everything they need to know about computer architecture, and they know that you know, running a cluster of a thousand nodes is easy. Um, and on the other hand, you've got people who aren't double deep, um, but you expect to be. So you've got people who maybe, you know, if you hire someone because they're a CPU verification expert, you can't expect them not to um, make mistakes if you're tasking them with running something at scale in a, in a grid environment, which is totally unfamiliar to them. So you have to sort of cope with that. Um, unbounded pace and growth. I've been really, really fortunate at ARM, having ridden a massive um, roller coaster ride of success over the 18 years I've been there. Um, but of course, that has meant that the pace we operate at and the growth that we've gone through has been pretty ridiculous. Um, and that's really challenging. Um, but I think fundamentally at the end of the day, you know, I always come back to this one because if, if I'm asked to describe myself and I don't want to use the architect term, I'll say I'm an automation engineer. My job is to um, automate things. Uh, and automation is your best friend forever. Data science is your new best friend for sure, but automation is your best friend forever. I used to have, I don't know if any of you remember the Think Geek, used to have a little bumper sticker that said, go away or I'll replace you with a very small shell script. I used to have that on my, used to have that on my desk. I lost, I lost it in one of the many moves and, and nobody seems to make it anymore. Right, so engineering at ARM. I thought actually, um, so we're a CPU uh, developer. That's what we're known for. Uh, you know, the ARM architecture and all that sort of stuff. But reality is that we do a lot of things. We have 5,000 odd engineers, probably 4,000 odd engineers in a company of 5,000 maybe. Um, and yeah, sure, we do CPUs and a lot of people do that stuff. But, um, but actually, we do an awful lot of software. We're about 35 to 40% software engineers uh, in our engineering caucus at the moment. And that's only going up. Because what do we do? We, you know, we have a kernel engineers. So a lot of the people that uh, work on Linux kernel or the Debian port of ARM and all that sort of thing work for us. They do that work. A lot of um, people who are, um, we have compiler engineers, we have our own compilers, um, but we also contribute to GCC's ARM port and to LLVM's ARM backend and all that sort of stuff. Um, we have a lot of people that write drivers so that, so that the ARM ecosystem works. We have an awful lot of that sort of software engineering. And then we're also moving more in, in the IoT space into providing sort of IoT services, um, which I'm not really going to touch on today. But so we've got, if that brings with it a bunch of different types of software engineering. So we do a lot of software. Um, we do our core 
hardware stuff, CPUs, GPUs, interconnect, DPUs, anyone? Display, process, units, those are. Um, apparently a GPU can't actually write to a screen. You need another PU in between the two to get there. That's what that one is. Um, and then, of course, the physical stuff. You, you've got to get this stuff into silicon at the end of the day. Um, and so there's an awful lot of stuff around cell libraries, memory compilers, um, GPI and things that, that, that you know, is really niche. Um, and we have a lot of engineering that works over there. Um, so we have a broad gamut of stuff that goes on. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, the stuff on the right because I, I figured that was the least familiar with, with the audience. So I'm kind of expecting an audience full of software engineers or people who are in that sort of software engineering world. So I'm going to talk a bit more about stuff on the right than the left. Um, in terms of the sort of needs, software is agile these days and, and you know, ever-changing, um, and we need to support that. You know, if we've got people working on the Linux kernel, we've got people working on Android, we've got people working on LLVM, we need to, to adapt and evolve as that uh, ecosystem adapts and evolves you know, and, and move with it and things like that. Um, in the middle and the hardware stuff, it's just all about scale. We need to verify the designs we're making. Um, it, as you can imagine, it's, it's, it's slightly more costly to, to have a bug on a piece of hardware than it is to have a bug on most software. Software can be patched, hardware can be patched, but often it's awkward. Um, and those of you my age and above will remember Intel's FDIV thing. Um, we don't want one of those. Um, and then on the physical design, actually, the key challenge from an infrastructure point of view is burstability, uh, because physical design tends to um, be very much sales driven. So um, physical design is all about getting a particular process technology um, to a point where you can deploy an arm, an arm chip to it. And we really don't know which process technology uh, PVTs our customers are going to want until they come to us. Uh, and in order to do one, it requires a massive amount of CPU time and, and data and, and things like that. Um, and we can get very little notice that these are needed. Whereas these, you know, a CPU design project might be three years. So we can predict, forecast what that might look like in terms of um, it need. We might be scared by the numbers we forecast. Spent too long on a slide. <laughs> uh, it's coming back. But at least we can predict it. Over here we can't. So those are the sort of challenges in terms of the illities that we have. Right. Um, so what are the hardware engineering processes? I thought I'd put up a simple diagram <laughs> of the sorts of things that uh, the hardware engineers go through. I then made the mistake of sharing it with a couple of my colleagues who are slightly more knowledgeable in this area than I am. And they said, well, you can't not have that line. You can't not have that thing. Um, so I didn't, didn't put er all of their suggestions on. Um, but this is where I got to when I decided it was busy enough and I stopped. Um, but, you know, in, in essence, I will go through this for you. So, you know, because I think you've got to look for analogies. This is very similar to software engineering in many ways. So we start off with a spec, we write some code, we test it. That is completely exactly the same. So if you're a hardware engineer, you're, you're writing code in a thing called a register transfer language, where you're sort of describing the behavior of what the, the hardware should look like. But a register transfer language look like Verilog would be very familiar to someone that's come from a software engineering background. They would be able to understand. They would be able to comprehend it. It just looks like code. Um, the only difference really is that in, in, a, in, a, in a piece of RTL, you've got to imagine everything happens in parallel. Whereas in a piece of software, usually, not always the case, but usually, you know, you can, you, as you follow the code down, it's, you're thinking about these things happening in sequential operation. Whereas in, uh, in RTL, if you look at, follow, follow the code down, you, you've got to think actually all of these things are happening at the same time. Um, so a piece of RTL might say, yeah, when, when the clock goes from naught to one, um, set this register to the sum of these two registers. And that, so it's a sort of almost trigger-based, event-based logic that you would put in um, things. But at the end of the day, it's code. And you test it in very much the same way, right? So we start off with unit-level testing, um, and then we, we might assemble it together into multi-blocks and test that as well. And eventually, we, we sort of stitch it together into uh, something that represents a system. Um, and at that point, it's still just in this abstract 
language. So then um, from that point onwards, in synthesized place and route to chip, that's when you know, it starts to get physical. So synthesis is the process of taking that abstract register transfer language and sort of compiling it down to uh, Boolean logic or, or the something that equates to the cells that you might put on the chip. Um, and then place and route is actually getting that to happen. And then you've got all sorts of things that happen at that point. You've got that sign off about power performance area. This is where you tune the thing. You might be, yeah, you might be trying to write you might have a target that says this, this chip needs to be able to run at a gigahertz. Right? So, so you won't know until you get down to this synthesized place and route step what your critical path is, how long, and you can estimate how long that would take. Um, and then you can sort of backtrack on that and say, actually, this won't get more than 800 megahertz on that technology. So we've got to go back to the drawing board, refactor some things, go back through. So you've got sort of loops that happen down in that physical space. But the majority of the work happens up in this logical space on the left here. Um, and the majority of stuff is just exactly the same that you would do as a software engineer. One of the biggest differences is uh, in software engineering, you tend to rely heavily on directed tests. So you will say, you know, you'll write a set of tests, say, what happened, when this happens, this should, this would be the result. Uh, on, in the hardware side, your um, state space is massive in comparison to most software and you can't really write directed tests to cover it all. So we use a lot of randomized testing um, to, to, to explore that, that state space. So you know, for a CPU, for example, we might use random instruction generators that generate legal but random sequences of instructions, and then we will run those through a model. Damn it. We'll run those through a model, and we'll run those through the uh, RTL as well, and we'll make sure we get the same result. And, and what we're trying to do is, is build confidence that the design works. We can't exhaustively test it at all, but we can build enough confidence uh, that the design works. And, and we have a sort of a quality metric that we sign off on, which says, okay, you ran you know, a, a, a billion, billion cycles without finding a major bug. Um, therefore, you know, we'll deem that that fit for purpose and we'll release it down the chain so that our partners can start putting it into, into uh, early test silicon. Um, so a typical CPU might run 11 million hours worth of simulation, which is the bread and butter of what we do. So simulation is obviously where it takes the RTL and it simulates that behavior and makes sure it runs. In order to do that, um, I'm not going to get anywhere through my slides if I'm going to keep you to your lunch. But never mind, that's fine. In order to do that, we use um, high throughput clusters. So we used to call them HPC, you know, high performance clusters, and, we, and most people still do within ARM. Um, I've been arguing for 18 years now that they're not really HPC. They're actually HTC, high throughput. So we have lots of very small jobs that are typically single threaded. And we have massive, great big queues of millions of them waiting to run. And they run for a few seconds or a few minutes each. And, we, and then we get the results back. Um, so it's about high throughput. Um, it's not really HPC in that classic world that people who work at the Met Office, whatever, will, will comprehend. Um, and this is becoming more of a problem, actually, in ARM. Because um, as we sort of move into the server market and we uh, acquire companies like Alinea that have software tools that work in the proper HPC world, they take a look at our HPC internal thing and go, well, that's not, it doesn't even do parallel processing, that's not HPC, it's not, it's high throughput. Um, so we have about, these numbers are probably out of date, but last time I looked, about 75,000 cores worth of compute uh, split across our three main regional hubs. We use um, LSF, platform LSF, to uh, to manage all the workloads and the, uh, and the jobs. And we use um, scale out NAS storage, NFS mounts to, um, to store all our data. It's very simple, it's very traditional. It's been like that for, you know, ever since I've been there. Just like on slightly different scale. So the first lesson that I'm gonna preach from, from this is that these shared platforms that we build um, for multiple disciplines. So if, if you think about um, this, there's a lot of engineering disciplines in that. Um, there's a lot of examples where you might have billions of tiny little 
uh, single core simulations that all take five minutes over here. You might have millions of things that need um, two terabytes of RAM over here, and you might have stuff that takes 10 days to run up there. And that sort of variation in, in workloads um, really is more trouble than it's worth running on these things. In, in, the, in the old days, we had to. But now, you know, we're beginning to think we don't need a shared platform. Um, sure, shared infrastructure, yes, that makes sense. These days, it's criminal not to do that. But shared platforms, no, we don't need to. We've got, we got all the tools and tricks now that, where we can sort of spin up um, task-specific platforms to, out of our shared infrastructure that are tuned for that sort of workload. Because shared platforms lead to compromise, um, additional effort on the part of engineers, um, and system noise, just the actual sort of volume of jobs going through and the, and the, the difference in shapes and, and topologies of those jobs that the scheduler's got to try and cope with and, and dispatch into, the, into, the, into that grid. It's, it's, just, it's just noisy and, and it's trouble. Um, and, it, and it leads to really bad compromises. So a long time ago, we, we, we used to say to the software guys, well, you have to use it too, because we're only going to support this one infrastructure. We can't afford to support you something. So they would be compiling their software tools on this same infrastructure. And that led us down a path of only ever installing vanilla operating systems, because the guys that were, in, that were compiling and releasing um, you know, a, a compiler for Red Hat 5, for example, didn't want to do it on a bastardized version of Red Hat 5 because it might not work at the customer site. So we stopped tuning our kernels, we stopped swapping in packages to, to get better performance, and we really dumbed down our offering. Um, but then we realized that actually, you know, 99.9% .9 of the time that machine is used to internally to run cycles where we would benefit from that additional optimization, and we're crippling ourselves by not doing it. So those sort of shared platforms are just not worth it. I mentioned pace of growth in that first slide. Um, and pace of growth is a really ch challenging one. Uh, Arm has always run lean. Um, I'm sure most companies do. Right? There isn't much. There aren't many spare bodies to do the important work of um, you know, improving our flows or anything like that. It's all done on the fly as part of the projects. And because of the growth, we just, you know, we tend to push. So, you know, engineering are demanding more and more resources and IT are trying really hard to sort of fill that gap. Um, and things are getting pushed beyond their limits. We don't have time to go back and redesign. We don't have any of this stuff. And, and there's a blame game starts to, to emerge um, at this where you know, engineers are blaming us, IT, for, for not being able to keep up with their requirements, and IT are blaming engineers for just not understanding that they're causing all these problems and why can't they refactor their flows to avoid that? And they're saying, well, we don't have time to do that. You just got to throw more resources in for us and things. Um, and and it's, a, it's a horrible place to be. Um, and, and the reality, the thing you have to remember and observe is that these are automation problems. There's, you know, there's nothing wrong with what IT are doing, there's nothing wrong with what engineering are doing, but really there's a missing piece, which is where we tune and automate and improve uh, the way things run in order to push that down. So my second lesson is automate where you can. Although I'm a big fan of this XKCD cartoon, cartoon as an automation engineer, I don't like it. Because I think... That's the bad side of automation. I couldn't find a comic that represented the good side of automation, so I went with it. But an automation at the infrastructure level is so easy now, and it's so nice, and, and I really like the whole infrastructure as code and configuration management of infrastructure type movement that DevOps has brought with it, because you know I'm a software engineer, not a sysadmin, and I really hated having to say, Maybe it's because I'm a software engineer, but surely that should be a script, not a person typing commands there. They go, no, no, this is how we do it. We're sysadmins. Let me put my cloak and my underpants on and I will fix this problem for you. Um. Right, storage. Ugh. This is a really old chart, actually, from many years ago, um, but I still use it today because it illustrates a number of points. It, it, it used to be a... PowerPoint slide with builds, but I've lost that in the meantime. But I'm going to very quickly illustrate a few points, very quickly, because I'm 
I'm running out of time. So this shows growth over time of our storage estate. Uh, and an engineer will, we will put, put this in front of an engineering saying, we can't keep doing this. This is ridiculous. This is unsupportable in the, in the long run time. And they'll go, well, whatever. Just buy more storage. Um, and, and we try saying, actually, you know, the, this, this much here to costs us a million dollars a year to, to keep online for you. So that's one, two, three. Are you still happy? And they're like, yeah, yeah. We've got lots of money. Buy more storage. Um, and, and they really don't, you know, we've ne we still haven't worked out a way to, um, to keep this, this manageable. Uh, this particular graph I like because it shows, it's not shown on here, but, but basically this point here um, was when we filled our disk at that point. Obviously, we bought some more, which is why it's allowed to go up there. But at this point here, we filled. So, so I know for sure, because I was there at the time, that from about here onwards, we were saying, dear engineering, we're getting close, we're going to fill, we're going to fill, we're going to fill. When we fill, we stop. When we fill, we stop. Come on. Delete some stuff, please. And nothing got deleted, nothing got deleted, until that point where we actually filled the disk. And then, whoa, what happened over the next two weeks when engineers couldn't actually create data? They deleted a load. Wow. Amazing. It can happen. Um, and I particularly like this pink one, you can see if, if, you're, if you're not colorblind, you can see that you know, one of the key ways that they got back, engineering got back into working mode um, was attacking this pink one here. This pink one turned out to be a project that was closed. There was nobody working on it anymore. It had stopped, people had stopped working it back here, they'd shut it down. But what they hadn't realized is they'd left a few um, CI jobs running, which every day we're producing a bit of data, and nobody was looking at it. Nobody even knew it was happening, it, despite the fact that we were showing them this graph. Um, and you can see that it just it was just growing and growing and growing, and then all of a sudden they're like, oh, actually, we don't need any of that. Gone. So. I'm going to skip that one. Um, so, our biggest, so our biggest storage problems, because I want to go on to... I don't want you to miss your coffee. Um, our biggest problems in the storage space, rogue jobs. Um, when you're running a shared infrastructure, shared, shared file system, you know, it doesn't take, and, and you've got this really efficient scheduler that's capable of dispatching lots of jobs into the, into the queue that can all attack that file system at once. It doesn't take much for a rogue job to bring it to its knees. Um, you know, the number of times when um, you know, people will launch a million jobs and into the queue, and maybe three, they'll, they'll be lucky there's a little bit of a lull, and maybe you know, 5,000 of those will, will actually dispatch at the same time. And, they, and they all, they're all trying to write to the same output file. Um, so all of a sudden, you've got 5,000 nodes in our estate trying to write to, to the same output file. And they're going, why, why is the file up on slow? I don't understand. Um, detritus, so that was what well, that picture before was. All right, flows are like teenagers. Um, Third-party tooling, this is a big one for us. So all of those on that EDA slide I showed you with all of the sort of processes that go on, those are all commercial tools that we buy. Right? So we don't actually know or have much control over how they work, um, which means when we hit a storage problem with a particular tool, there's a lot of toing and froing between us and the vendor. The vendor says it works fine in our environment. Yeah, but it breaks ours. Um, you know, that sort of stuff. But really, the big problem is this, this unconstrained growth. And, and, and it's because we have a ubiquitous provision, right? So we're saying um, we can't grow our compute environment without growing our storage alongside it because we say every compute node has access to all the storage. Uh, it breeds lazy engineering because it doesn't mean that the flows don't have to comprehend their data movement requirements. Um, so shared storage is evil, is my third lesson that I... Let me give you, perhaps evil's a little bit harsh, but ubiquitous shared storage is definitely evil. Um, so much so that I posited a couple of years ago at, at an internal conference within ARM that, that actually we, if there was such a thing as storage abusers anonymous, that ARM engineering ought to go. <coughs> um, because they do that all the time. I even defined a 12-step program, which was our way of beating this addiction 
Okay, and, and I think actually if I look at what we're doing even today, it fits within this framework. We, do, we are still doing this stuff. We are still desperately trying to get engineering to admit they have a problem. Um, we're still desperately trying to get those that have admitted it to find the time to change. Um, and we're still desperately trying to um, put stuff in place that helps us even just accelerate that process, but you know, protect us in some ways. Uh, it's an ongoing pro pro process. I even went as far, and th this worked really well. Okay, so th this is a set of slides that I presented to an internal engineering uh, group, which is about what happens when you write a file to a disk in a shared shared environment. Um, so at this time, at this point in time, we had a an 85 node storage cluster, and I said, okay, well. Um, you know, and when you when you write a file, you know you've got to get an exclusive lock across all those 85 nodes. So there's a whole bunch of negotiation that has to happen between those nodes to to before they all commit that right. Um, and I was able to describe in in painstaking detail exactly what that means in terms of how the L1 cache on the local nodes and the shared L2 cache and all the communication between them. And and remember, I'm I'm doing this to an audience of CPU engineers. And all of a sudden, they're like, oh, hang on a minute, I understand that, because that's exactly what, how we build CPUs, the same problem. Right? We have multi-cores, they have individual L1s, they have shared L2, yeah, they've got to do all that. We, we know to, to avoid that synchronized problem, we get it, we understand. Can I correlate this to any change in behavior? No. But never <laughs> Final storage one, this is an example of uh, of a rogue job. So the green line is um, GetAtra uh, activity. So GetAtra is the NFS protocol that, you know, when you do a stat of a file or, or an LS or something like that, GetAtra is the actual NFS call that gets made. So the green line is, is that, and this is what we like to see, da -da 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 -da, normal. Oh, something nasty happened there. Um, but then here, all of a sudden, you can see it just went bonkers. Um, and it turned out, in this case, it was a flow um, that was creating a bunch of uh, tests. Uh, it was a random instruction set generator, so it would generate a, uh, a binary that would then execute. So it was creating a, a whole bunch of tests, and then the execution, ex execution part of that uh, would look to see whether the test was there before it would run it. Um, and this was launched at scale into our estate, and at, the, at this point here, there were about 3,000 uh, of these jobs running, and it sounds okay. And as a, as a verification engineer, you're going to say, actually, you know, sound logic to what I'm doing. But, but the problem was, the tests were all stored in a single directory. This directory had, at this point in time, 485,000 files in it, because um, they just accumulated tests over time. Uh, and the script that was making sure a file existed before launching it was using find. <laughs> yeah, I'm not going to say any more about that. I still, it still irks me. But if you think about it from the engineer's point of view, he probably doesn't think he's done anything wrong, really, because maybe he's not explicitly calling find. For all I know, he's using some Python library that happens to use find underneath to achieve the result. I don't know. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so the blame doesn't lie necessarily engineer. The blame lies wholly at, at the whole system level, right? In terms of system level optimization, we are not buddying up an automation engineer with that verification engineer to make sure that those uh, flows are good. So I guess lesson four is don't expect engineers to make sensible choices <coughs> in domains they aren't experts in, right? So, okay, they know their stuff, we know ours. Um, so, and don't just be the police either. Yeah, the, the, the horrible thing is, you know, that this is policing that we do in order to maintain our estate. But, but it, it's way too late. We should be working with them up front and educating them into what to do. Right, I am going to talk very quickly about pioneers and settlers, and then I might stop. Um, so I think, um, this is a great analogy that I've seen a few people use, and I really like it. And it's a risk versus reward play, okay? So you've got two types of, of engineering team. Uh, you've got settlers, and they want low risk. 
they want a stable environment that works for them. They don't want to worry about it. They just want it to work. Um, and, that's how, and then you've got yeah, pioneers up there who typically tend to be hipsters wearing hats and no socks, in my experience. Um, or software engineers, maybe, yeah, that is. I don't know. The pioneers, you know, they want, they're willing to take on some of that risk in order to get the reward. They want to try new things, um, and they want to experiment. Um, and, and within a company like Arm, it's a mini sort of ecosystem of the world. We're going to get both, and we're going to get lots of both. And the biggest mistake anybody can make is to try and do a one-size-fits-all solution here in the middle. So here you go. This is our offering to you. It, it's relatively risk-free, relatively stable, um, but it's not, you know, it's not risk-free enough for these guys, and it's not anything like as adventurous for these guys. So you're disappointing everybody um, by doing that. You know, you really, if you go, you really need to sort of be pitching, aiming to provide something down here um, that allows the settlers to get more reward with no, with no more risk and allows the pioneers to get the reward they want and, and reduce their risk. You can't do this with a single offering. You've got to provide a toolbox uh, solution in this space. It's the only way of doing it. And then you've got to be really careful while you do this that you don't leave the legacy guy behind, right? The guy who, who hasn't had a chance to change any of his stuff. He may have been a pioneer one day, um, but now he's stuck supporting an old system that, that you know, isn't very good because of... Uh, that's it telling me it's coffee time. I'm going to skip these. So lesson five is let builders build. Right? Um, you know, don't, don't constrain them. Decentralized infrastructure groups, brilliant. Sharing best practice, even better. Um, you know, focus on sharing the recipes and common methods. Don't focus on controlling everything. And create a safe environment where you know, those pioneers aren't going to affect the settlers by mucking their world up. Um, this slide here is from a colleague of mine, which I won't go into because I haven't got time, but it, it, I, I like it. It's a Lego analogy that says the same thing. Right. I was going to talk about running EDA stuff in the, chat, in the cloud because it's, it's more challenging than you might think, but I've run out of time, so I'm not going to do that. Um, but I was just going to finish by saying, uh, you know, there were five lessons in that, um, some comedy along the way, yes. you want. And, and lesson six will be, at some point, because I'm a futurist in, in, in our space, it's all going to be about APIs, data sets, machine learning. It's no different from what's happening in the world. It's, it will apply to the, to the EDA space. Um, and these, that's the sort of area of uh, focus for me, for me now is, is actually how we... Uh, how we benefit from those. Right. It is spot on 11. So I, I can take questions, but you are trading questions for coffee. <laughs> <laughs> this is your, you your call. Oh, is it? Yes. I was relying on that. <laughs> All right, we've got five minutes for questions. Uh, yes. Are there any uh, architectural models that you'd recommend, like uh, Togaf? Um, so I haven't spent much time looking at Togaf, I must admit. I, I, although enterprise architecture is a fairly new thing for us in ARM, um, we hired our first proper enterprise architect in, into the enterprise IT space, not, not into my space, into, into that space a few years ago. He's a, he's a, he's a great guy. Um, and I, I have, I, in my role, I kind of dotted line report into him as well as being part of engineering. So, so I, I'm very familiar with that side of things. Um, but he has a very pragmatic approach to these things. And he's like, yeah, there's, there's that sort of maturity level. And, and we're, we're essentially a, um, a research company, all right? Um, or, uh, you know, often described as just a loose collection of startups, almost, in terms of how we operate as, a, as an engineering function. And all of those sorts of, that sort of stuff just doesn't work in our environment. So there's a little bit more discipline that they, they're, that's coming into the enterprise side of things and how we, you know, around our SAP system for how we do um, 
royalty recognition and how we sell stuff and and, and there's a lot of I can see a lot of maturity in that space and and you know we've got some proper EAs who are beginning to deploy some of these models and it's working well in there but but my job is to sort of make sure it doesn't go anywhere near engineering <laughs> um, so on that note I can't recommend anything because it's not my area of expertise I, I'm an enterprise architect in name only. <laughs>